you will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Good morning, class. In the last few lectures, I've talked about the history of technology in the business area. But today, I want to use Samuel Cunard as our case study, who was a shipping magnate that founded the Cunard Line. Now, Cunard was born in Canada. When he first left home, he was still a teenager. Then he came into a US company as a worker and learned how to sail there. During the War of 1812, Cunard volunteered for service in the 2nd Battalion of the Halifax Regiment Militia and rose to the rank of captain. He held many public offices, such as volunteer fireman and lighthouse commissioner, and maintained a reputation as not only a shrewd businessman, but also an honest and generous citizen. When he went to England, his friends cooperated with him, and together they coined a shipping company. The company had instant wealth and could deal with more than one cargo, for its major business was in North America and the Atlantic. From then onwards, Cunard became a highly successful entrepreneur in British shipping and one of a group of 12 individuals who dominated the affairs of England. In 1838, the British government, impressed by the advantages of steam sailing for making regular passages, invited tenders to carry the transatlantic mails by steamer. Back then, mail contact through steamships brought more punctuality while other types of ships were always delayed. The journey times were flexible, with a transatlantic crossing lasting for six weeks and with no fixed times of departure or arrival. So it was never known when the mail would arrive, or, since so many sailing ships foundered, whether it would arrive at all. What Cunard wanted, in line with the thrusting new technology of the Victorian age, was a maritime extension of the brand, new timetabled railways on land. Cunard's experience in steamship operation with observations of the growing railway network in England encouraged him to explore the creation of a transatlantic fleet of steamships which would cross the ocean as regularly as trains crossed land and that's why he went to the United Kingdom seeking investors in 1837. He set up a company with several other businessmen to bid for the rights to run a transatlantic mail service between the UK and North America for £55,000 annually for 10 years. The bid was successful. Almost at the same time, Cunard cooperated with an English businessman and established the British and North American Royal Mail Steam Packet Company, the ancestor of the Cunard Line. In 1840, the company's first steamship sailed from Liverpool to Boston, Massachusetts, with Cunard and 63 other passengers on board, marking the beginning of regular passenger and cargo service. Establishing a long, unblemished reputation for speed and safety, 
Cunard's company made ocean liners a success in the face of many potential rivals who lost ships and fortunes. Cunard's ships proved successful, and he then opened many branches. But the high cost saddled Cunard with heavy debts by 1842, so some of them went bankrupt. But what Cunard needed then was a port. After a lot of consideration, he finally opted for Boston because he was very familiar with this city where he had once worked it. Fortunately, by 1843, Cunard ships were earning enough to pay off his debts and begin issuing modest but growing dividends. But the city did more than give Cunard silverware. Winters can be tough here in Boston. For example, in the year of 1844, one ship sank because of the winter freeze. The ship hit icebergs and caused a heavy loss to the company. Then, the board recommended the company to move to New York, and it was a huge success and then became one of the biggest US shipping companies. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Come in, Helen. What can I do for you? Well, I'm doing research for the anthropology project, and I was hoping to ask for some help for a few details. Sure. I remember you opted for Pacific Tapper Cloth as the topic, didn't you? What did you figure out so far? Well, I was going to introduce my project by stating that Tapper Cloth is fibre made from bark, just the outer layer of the trees, which are particularly universal among the Pacific Islands, but not exclusive to them. Actually, people in other parts of the world have also produced high-quality cloth from bark. But what sets Pacific Tapper apart is the incredibly varied role it plays in this region. Nice! So what about raw materials that are used in the production? Well, Tapper cloth is made from many species of trees. In the Pacific, the paper mulberry tree is most common, but it doesn't thrive in all conditions. In fact, it wasn't discovered in the islands at first, but was carried in canoes by the first migrants. Tapper is also made from the breadfruit tree, which is a more convenient way, because its fruit is the staple food. The paper mulberry tree is only grown for tapper-making mills. Yes, that's right. Then how about the Maori people here in New Zealand? Well, at present, the Maori don't produce tapa. Yeah, but I suggest you should take it into account. We know that when Maori migrated here from other Pacific islands, they were ready to produce tapa because they took the paper mulberry tree with them. The thing was, after they'd been in New Zealand a bit, they found the flax plant is superior to tapa because it makes stronger fabric. By the time Europeans arrived in the 18th century, Maori were producing all their fabric from flax rather than the tapa and had been for some time. OK, so in terms of the production process itself, first the inner bark is beaten with a wooden hammer to soften the fibres. Then, the various pieces are glued together using adhesive paste made from the aloe root tuber, which is the only way to fabricate large pieces of cloth, because bark strings are too fine to be woven together, and stitch isn't strong enough. That is the end of section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2 First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hello, I'm delighted to welcome you to our mining community and very pleased that you're interested in the ores and pits of this area. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised with your special experience here. Now, let me start by giving you some warnings on safety rules and regulations. Rule number one, always wear safety equipment. There is a litany of safety equipment that mining workers use for their protection, from helmets to safety glasses and gloves. It is essential that all workers wear the necessary safety equipment at all times. There have been countless stories of workers being saved by helmets, which are the hard hats that you can see on the shelf beside you. So, visitors wearing helmets is mandatory in the mining area, although you are free to take them off when you're in the mining museum and picnic area. You won't need to pay any deposit, though you should return them to the counter once you finish the visit. The helmets are offered in all sizes, so choose a suitable one. All right. Our mining community is currently being refurbished for some of the main area, so please make a note of that, and you'll know what to look out for. So, when you go in or out of the mine, please pay attention to the road, for it has just been repaired because of the rough surface and can be really slippery since it's still wet. The history and process of tin mining are complicated and involve a lot of special words, but here you will see how it was and still is done. After a short five to ten minute walk, visitors can track round a numbered route with clear explanations. Most of the tour is in the open air, so nice weather helps. All areas are clearly posted with signs, but if you have problems travelling around or climbing up and down, you can turn to the staff here and we are happy to help. If you are interested, Blue Hills Tin Stream is a working water-powered tin streaming mill that gives visitors a very clear idea of how difficult it is to get tin out of rock. I hope you'll enjoy the informative indoor presentation and this self-guided tour, but you have to bear one thing in mind, that smoking is forbidden throughout the whole community. Though you can take phones and of course use them, you'll also be surprised that there will be more than just one place to go in the mine. The underground tunnel is now being refurbished and only relevant workers can access it. But it will soon be all finished and I believe it's a lovely place for you to explore around. Don't forget to wear protective clothing. It's mandatory. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Morning, Jenny. Hi, Tim. How's everything going on? Not bad, but I'm really nervous about our geography assessment next week. Have you done any work on it yet? I've just gone over some of the slides where there are a few difficult terms, but I think it would be helpful if I could discuss it together with someone else. Would you like to talk about it with me? That sounds great. Have you got any information about the requirements for the assessment? For our test last semester, all of us tried our best to collect raw data to meet the requirements so as to achieve a pass. But according to what the tutor has said, this term there won't be any need for us to do so. I read through the notes and they said that we are all going to be given a set of instructions that we can choose to follow if we wish, but it's not mandatory and we can complete the exam as we wish. I don't think that it will be hard for us to pass the assessment. As long as we don't copy the answers from anyone else's exam paper, I think we'll be sure to pass. Definitely, I agree. Shall we put on a slideshow presentation with the information on all kinds of volcanoes? I think it will really help us to revise the recognition. OK, great. First, let's look at Pompeii, which is regarded as the most famous one among all the volcanoes. Therefore, we might find it much easier to find a large amount of information about it on the net. I think we should exclude some of the pictures in the presentation, since many people were killed, and some of them can be quite disturbing. It is so lucky that there is going to be a double free break today. 
so we will have a bit of time to modify this together. Well, the next one to mention is Mount Fago. This is an ancient, mythical volcano whose site is still ambiguous. In Mexico as well as the USA, there are mountainous regions, both of which are rumored to be the location of this volcano. It's not that reasonable to list two unrelated locations for one volcano, but since no one has been capable of figuring out which is the correct one, we have no choice. It's amazing that we cannot find any other example of a volcano in existence today that is haunted by so much mystery. Definitely yes. I suggest we better search online for some information about Mount Etna in Sicily, which is well known for the stunning panoramas that one can appreciate from its peak. According to Google, it's a relatively new volcano compared to the others in the nearby region. That's the reason why it has very few of the features found in older volcanoes. Oh, interesting. Might we present any information on Mount Hurton? Because I don't think that any of the other students have carried out much of a survey into it, even though it has several unique traits. Well, then I think we can just ignore it, since it's a man-made volcano and not that closely linked to our syllabus, and probably won't be tested in the exam questions. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for returning to Action Radio. We are here talking about current affairs and global issues. I am Jill, and today our focus will be on discussing the very concerning issue of the significance of water conservation and how you can make your own contribution at home. The most universal wasted energy of all the domestic kinds is heat. Yet since my house has well insulated walls, I'm lucky enough not to need to do anything about this problem. Yet, I still found out that a large amount of water was wasted owing to my way of life. I looked into a few approaches online, trying to reduce my water usage as much as possible, and have been pleasantly surprised to figure out that there are experts in that field who can make some instant changes to my home. But the only dark side is this work is so costly that there are no means for me to get financial help. Now, if any of you listeners are interested in reducing your energy usage, here are a couple of easy and positive changes you can make immediately. A lot of the magazines will recommend that you change your bulbs for those with energy-saving capabilities. However, I have found that these make little difference to your electricity bill, and they also severely reduce the light levels in your home. Instead, simply switch off all plug sockets and appliances to make an immediate saving on your electricity consumption. If this doesn't make enough of a saving for you, you could later turn down the thermostat as well. Even though my energy provider gave me a discount on my bills for prompt payments, this doesn't make enough of a saving for my monthly bill, considering the amount of energy that I was using. 
so I felt like switching to another provider. Not only could I make a considerable monthly saving, but also get other perks from the new company. The bills can now be paid online, for instance, which was a thrill to me because it saves me from driving to the bank. If our contract endures more than one year, they will also provide me with a deduction for all the energy-saving appliances I am currently using. Now, many of you listeners will have an electricity meter at home, so I'm very sure that all of you will know the problems associated with them. These meters can occupy a lot of room in your home and can be very unsightly if you cannot tuck them away in a cupboard. Mine is very large and it measures both gas and electricity usage, but it is nicely hidden in the coat cupboard, and I'm lucky enough to escape from accessing it easily. But the cons about this is that whenever I need to take a meter reading, I'll have to use a torch because it is hidden in darkness, and without a flashlight, I can't read the numbers on the screen correctly. I recently extended my house with a new room that gives us a bathroom with a low energy boiler. So I'm able to take long showers guilty-free. My walls are nice and thick and well insulated, but disappointingly, the window is a little drafty. Thus, I am about to make some investments by doing some upgrading. Given renewable energy, I initially thought about installing solar panels on the roof to heat the water rather than applying a new low-energy boiler, which was the price-friendly alternative. But I finally determined that the panels would make my house ugly on the exterior, in spite of their ease of technical use. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now, if you are keen on taking long showers, as I am, switching from baths to showers doesn't change much on your total water usage. Instead, some small effective changes can be quite helpful and efficient. When making a cup of tea, for instance, before boiling water, measure out the amount that you need during the procedure. Also, when brushing teeth, use a cup of water instead of leaving the tap water running. I would recommend you not to fill up the washing machine before switching it on, because I found out that the clothes were not thoroughly cleaned. Also, call a plumber to fix your dripping taps. This will give rise to a great reduction of water being wasted. Before finishing today's show, I'd like to address two questions that we often get asked by listeners. We had some great feedback about our answer to last week's question on how to calculate the price involved. Empowering domestic appliances. So let's see how we do this week. One of the most commonly asked questions this week was, which device is the lowest energy option for watching films? The simplest answer is that the smaller the screen, the lower the energy used. One of our listeners wrote in with a question that made me chuckle, and the answer is yes. Solar panels only work when the sun is out. Now, on a more serious note. A number of you wanted to know what the most efficient temperature is to set the thermostat to. The answer is that the closer you set it to room temperature, the lower the energy used. Before saying goodbye today, I'll give you one last tip: turn off all the lights when you leave the room. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hi everyone, my name's Dr. Hubert Johnson and I've been asked to speak to you about my experiences in the healthcare industry concerning something that affects all health professionals, improving efficiency. It seems to be a given these days that practices will struggle with a lack of efficiency. Uh, we've actually found that this expectation in and of itself can reduce efficiency and increase delays even further. In a recent survey, when patients were asked why they arrived late to their appointments, 30% said that they had assumed that the previous appointment would run long. Patients expect to be kept waiting, and to some extent, we expect that patients will be kept waiting. And so the first thing we need to address is our attitudes and the attitudes of our patients. So let me start by telling you about the efficiency I observed in a practice I visited a couple of weeks ago. At this practice, patients could not make appointments online, but they could either phone up or make an appointment in person. There were never more than two receptionists working in the morning, and the practice generally scheduled 80 appointments each day. Patients who were not attending a follow-up appointment were required to make their appointment on the day of. Can you imagine what that practice was like in the first couple of hours they were open? The receptionists were inundated by calls and walk-ins trying to schedule appointments. As you can imagine, patients who had seen what the practice was like in the morning expected that if they didn't have the first slot of the day, they'd be delayed by at least 10 minutes. So naturally, they arrived to their appointment 10 minutes late. One of the most important things you really must address in your practice in order to improve efficiency is the way you present your practice to patients. If they believe that you are always running late, guess what? They'll be running late too. Now, let's think for a moment about what needs to be done on the patient's end before an appointment can take place. You might be thinking that there are only two steps to the process. One, the patient books an appointment, and two, the patient arrives at the practice in time for their appointment. Well, we healthcare professionals often forget that there's actually a step that comes before this. Firstly, the patient must decide that their issue is significant enough to warrant an appointment. So, about a decade ago, my practice was really struggling from a lack of efficiency. I was working extremely long hours to try to accommodate everyone, and I was becoming increasingly frustrated with conducting appointments that didn't seem strictly necessary. I got to thinking about how I might be able to help patients to reconsider their initial assumption when booking appointments and to treat minor issues at home. At the same time, I did not want my patients to feel unsupported. I decided that I would begin to give weekly presentations in the evenings about self-care. As I tended to see a multitude of patients coming in for similar issues that they could actually treat themselves, each week I focused on a different common theme. The presentations lasted for just one hour, but I found that they resulted in seven fewer unnecessary appointments each week. These days, of course, I no longer have to give a physical presentation. Uh, thanks to modern technology, I simply upload instructional videos to our practice's website. We also email these videos out to patients periodically. We can and should make use of technology as a tool in our practices to help us improve efficiency. However, it's important to note that while many, perhaps even the majority of your patients, will be capable of using technology to arrange their appointments, there are many people uncomfortable or unable to use technology, so you must always make sure that these patients are accommodated too. Providing your patients with more options rather than replacing old options is often the best practice for improving efficiency. Now, let's move on to look at a practice that used technology in a surprising way. Cystic fibrosis is a condition that causes mucus to be thicker and stickier than it should be. Dr. Tadida Hussain specializes in cystic fibrosis treatment and is here to share her thoughts on caring for people with the condition. Tadida, can you tell us a bit more about patients who suffer from cystic fibrosis? Absolutely. 
Sufferers tend to carry two to five times as much salt in their bodies as those without the condition, mm -hmm. so you can see why their mucus is thicker than average. Treatment for these patients is usually quite time-consuming and repetitive. Patients are often required to stay in hospital for long stretches. And as the symptoms of the condition begin to present very early on in the patient's life, many of my patients are young people. And so we tend to see lots of patients with cystic fibrosis finding these hospital visits frustrating. Right. In fact, throughout the UK, about 80% of patients with cystic fibrosis who are hospitalised report feeling at least minimal levels of depression. How about young patients who aren't currently hospitalised? What can be challenging about their treatment? Well, patients can be required to take around 30 pills a day to keep cystic fibrosis under control. So it's understandable that teenagers and young people who just want to be free and independent might resent this ordeal if they think they can get away with it. Mm -hmm. One of the most difficult things we have to contend with is the fact that if patients stop taking their medication or doing their daily breathing treatments, their condition won't immediately worsen. Instead, it will gradually become more severe until they contract a serious infection, which puts their lives at risk. So what approaches do you use when treating patients with cystic fibrosis? Well, we've found distraction therapy to be extremely useful. We're incredibly lucky to have received a donation of a number of virtual reality headsets following their success in a number of treatment trials. We use the virtual reality headsets to transport the patient to outdoor settings, often corresponding to the activities they're required to do with us. When they complete breathing exercises on a stationary bike, for example, mm -hmm. the VR headsets display a virtual outdoor bike ride. Our patients find it helpful to pretend to be somewhere else during treatment, and it's often easier for us to administer breathing treatments to patients using these headsets, as they're more relaxed when they're not focused on the actuality of the test. So, what sorts of changes have you seen in your patients as a result of these methods? One of my patients, a 24-year-old man with cystic fibrosis who was in hospital waiting for a lung transplant, well, he found treatment very difficult at first. He was preoccupied by his need for a transplant and frustrated by feelings of powerlessness. He would often resist treatment. We started using the virtual reality systems with him as soon as we got them, and it took a while for him to get on board, but when he did, it was like someone had breathed new life into him. Not only did he stop hindering his treatment, he actually began to look forward to it. He's even started helping us to think about other ways we can improve the experiences of our patients, like improving social interaction. Ah, uh, yes, I understand that there are difficulties involved in patient communication. Mm. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.